I think I met you with Dr. Anoop Kenodia a couple of years ago. Oh, we're live. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Dr. Stephen Masley, and we just want to welcome you. Unfortunately, Dr. Tom couldn't be here. He had to fly home unexpectedly because um, Marzi's under the weather. So if you pray, send her prayers. If you send good energy, send her good energy, but please keep her in your thoughts. So we're so excited tonight to be here with you, Dr. Steven. And I'm really excited about this topic because I feel like this isn't talked about enough. I love the Mediterranean diet. And um, so I'm just eager to hear all about this. And I wanna get here on Facebook to be able to see who's here joining us. So give me a second to find this, but um, actually let's just start. Tell us, um, well, actually let's start with um, the fact that Dr. Tom and Marzi had the pleasure of getting to be on the boat with you this summer in Italy. And Dr. Tom was telling me on the phone today that you're cooking your chef and your cooking is absolutely just amazing. He literally like went off on it. And so how did you learn to cook? Well, years ago, I was doing in research studies. And what my patients told me is they didn't need so much more information. What they wanted were recipes that were delicious, easy to prepare, and you could find the ingredients in your local grocery store. So I actually went back, I went to the Four Seasons restaurant in Seattle and spent a year doing a cooking, a chef's internship. This I was tried. after medical school? This was, I had been working as a physician for like, seven, eight years. So I was working full-time as a physician. And then I signed up to spend every other evening for of the week and every other weekend for a year cooking an eight hour shift at the Four Seasons in Seattle. It was awesome. I really did learn a lot about cooking and it helped my recipes get better. So when Tom and Marzi were with us on the boat, we would you know, go out and eat in a restaurant. We would try to pick a healthy, delicious meal. And then we'd ask them, how did you make that dish? And they would invariably say, we can't tell you, we have to kill you if <laughs> you knew it. So what we would do is we'd go to the market and we'd ask the people in the market, hey, we had this dish at this restaurant. Can you give us what the ingredients are so we can buy them from you? And they were thrilled to tell us. And then we'd take it back to the boat and we would try cooking it. And sometimes it would take two or three times, but eventually you would nail it and you'd have this awesome dish. And my, my line was, if I can cook it on a sailboat, you should be able to make it in your kitchen. So that's what Tom and Marzi were experimenting with us was we were collecting recipes as we sailed from Spain all the way to Turkey. And we had them with us in Italy and it was amazing. We had so much fun. That's wonderful. I love that. I love that you took the time to learn how to cook because food is our medicine. So Anne is here from Michigan. Hello, Anne. And yes, you're looking forward to tonight's topic too. I am as well. And Mary's from Tampa. Cindy's from Pennsylvania. Tracy's from South Carolina and Grace is from Argentina. Wow, good. And UK is in the house. Welcome. Um, Lise or Liz, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. So wonderful, people are starting to join. So what is the Mediterranean diet, Dr. <clears throat> Stephen? Well, it's really diverse. It's this cuisine that's come from Spain, France, Italy, Greece, Turkey, and Northern Africa. So what they, what, so it's, it's, it has incredible variety which is a big advantage. And what do they all have in common is they use lots of vegetable, fruit, beans, nuts. They use mostly olive oil to cook with. They use lots of herbs and spices and garlic and Italian herbs and French herbs and like rosemary and thyme and oregano and basil and parsley. You know, they use them in abundance. Um, they, and, and they have some seafood, poultry and some dairy. Um, if you're dairy intolerant, clearly that's easy. You can skip it. And as Tom and Marzi and I, and my wife, Nicole, and I, we noticed there's all sorts of gluten-free options now. You know, 
not just in the US, but in the Mediterranean area as well. So oftentimes we would see that you could easily do this and be gluten free. That was a that's an easy no brainer. I think what they don't do is they don't eat processed food. They don't eat food with chemicals and sweeteners in it. Um, they tend to eat things that are real food that you cook, you prepare. It, it's simple. They don't make complicated meals and the food is just delicious and fantastic. If I was to, I think the US News and World Report summed it up. They said the Mediterranean diet three years in a row is the best overall diet on the planet. It's the healthiest diet. It's the best prevent diabetes. It's been one of the best preventing heart disease. Um, and it's the easiest diet to follow. I think that's important. It's simple, mm -hmm. the recipes are simple and it's really easy to follow a Mediterranean eating plan so you can stay with it long-term. So people need to get back into the kitchen. You have a nice background with that beautiful kitchen in the background, but that's really the key, right? Is to yes. just get back in the kitchen and start having fun with food. It, it really, Michelle, it really is about having fun with food. It's about going to the grocery store, buying food, bringing it home and having a plan on what to make. And I think Europeans do that better than we, that's something we could really learn to do in the United States and Canada and more is we could think about making food that's simple, fresh, local ingredients and trying to use them more often. And, and, and it's, it can be fun the food is delicious and it, it, the meals are not hard. They're, they're really pretty simple and easy to prepare. And that, Dr. Tom, when, he was when I was talking to him this morning, he said that your recipe book, the pictures are beautiful, which is so key for me. I have to have beautiful pictures in my book. And so I will be buying this book and I want the special bonus because the cooking classes, I wanna learn from you. Mm -hmm how to do these cooking classes. So they're videos? The cooking yeah, classes? So, I, what, so if they use the link that you have and they buy the book, they can send us that receipt. And I've created a series of free cooking classes that go through the recipes in the book, you know, kind of like recipes like these. I mean, oh, really beautiful. fantastic, easy to make. So if someone gets the book, I will offer them my free video cooking class series um, because you know, what are the, how are the tips for using herbs, for using olive oil properly for simple, quick meals that your friends and family will love, you know, that are good for your heart, brain, and soul. I think we need more simple, quick, easy meals that people love sure. that are good for us, right? All of us need that. So that's what this is all about. Exactly. My clients are constantly like with the overwhelm, right? They're, they want to eat healthfully, but they're so overwhelmed. So to have this book, to be able to get into the kitchen, to make this healthy food easily and quickly is going to be just a gift. So that's great. So what are the common myths around the Mediterranean diet? Well, I think one of them is that you just can eat endless quantities of bread, pasta, and like pizza. And it's just not true. I mean, one, those are all really high gluten sources. And even if you eat gluten-free, sometimes gluten-free is just like sugar. It has a really high glycemic load. So, I mean, on the boat, sometimes we did eat with Tom Norris, we had pasta, but it would be like gluten-free and we had a appetizer portion. So in Italy, when you eat pasta, it's a little, on a little salad plate. And then you afterwards, you have a big vegetable and <laughs> protein portion. It's not the main course. It's just to whet your appetite. So. I, yeah, so one myth is that we can just eat huge portions of pasta and bread and that's crazy. Um, I mean, another one would be that uh, you can cook everything at every temperature with olive oil. Olive oil has a smoke point that's only 400 degrees. So it's good for salad dressings, um, simmer, for low heat. It's not good for searing something at high heat. I tend to use avocado oil or almond oil for high heat cooking. And if I picked a third one, maybe it would be that you just can't drink red wine all day. I mean, people think Mediterranean diet means, you know, endless red wine. And we had really good red wine on the boat. But um, <laughs> it's, you get a glass. When you go out to eat in like Italy or Greece or Spain, 
they serve you a big bottle of water. The only question is sparkling or flat, <laughs> you know? And you're gonna drink a big bottle of water between two people and you're gonna get a glass of wine, red wine. And you know, yes, the wine's delicious, but it's only a glass. Mostly it's about really you drink more water. And yes, you can have wine with dinner, but it's usually red wine, not white wine. And it's a small portion, one, not more than two servings. And water's what we really need more of. Those would be just like three examples of myths Those that I think we, we don't wanna, we, too many people um, get the wrong information. Exactly. And they do seem to do such a better job with portion sizes than we do. Yeah, they don't drink the whole bottle. It's so true. So Paul is uh, saying that Alaska's in the house. It's always fun to see where people are from all the different um, areas. Tracy says she's been on the Mediterranean diet for 35 years, which is awesome. Mia's here from North Wales. Um, so that's great. Now back to some more questions. So how does it benefit our health? How does the Mediterranean diet? I know there's so many things. So let's just point out some. Well, the foods in it tend, I mean, it's like the best diet for living longer. I mean, what are the, in, in the next five, 10 years, Spain's becoming the longest lived planet. People will live the longest on the planet. It used to be Japan, but in Japan, they're eating too, they're shifting. And more and more people are eating processed food and their health is falling apart. You know, I think if a Mediterranean diet is easier to follow and more people follow it. So Spain's becoming the longest lived planet in the, in the world. Greece, they live a lot. They live more than five years longer than we do in the U.S., despite that their economy is in shambles and they're having all these financial problems and they're all stressed out and they smoke a lot. And despite that, the food they eat really makes them live longer. So, I mean, one, it's the longest lived area in the planet. Um, two it helps prevent heart disease. And we know that when we had people follow a Mediterranean diet instead of a low fat diet, their cognitive function improved and they had less progression of dementia. So it protects your brain, your heart, your brain. Three, weight loss. When you look at studies that are one year long, not a two week study or not a six week study where you lose weight and gain it back. But if you look at one year weight loss studies, Mediterranean diets are like awesome. You know, the average person lost anywhere from 12 to 20 pounds and mm -hmm. kept it off for more than a year if they go on a Mediterranean diet. I mean, to me, you can lose 12 to 20 pounds for over a year and never gain it back. That's like amazing. And it's delicious food. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the health benefits are enormous. Longevity, lower cancer, less kidney disease, less heart disease, less memory loss, weight loss. I mean, it just goes on and on. So... I think we're really fortunate that the easiest diet to follow might be one of the most delicious diets to eat and have the most health benefits all at the same time. I mean, that's incredible. It is really incredible. It's amazing. So you have a bit of a skinny twist on the plan. And why did you feel there was the need for this change? Well, you know, like having, having talked with Dr. Tom and other experts and think, I mean, people are eating way too many grains and refined mm -hmm. sugars and things like that. So if I think if you look historically in the Mediterranean diet, so if we go back to the 1950s, 1960s, most people following it were farmers, fishermen, and herders. They were active six, eight hours a day. And almost none of us in today's world are active for six to eight hours a day. And we can't handle as much blood sugar rise in from our food is that. And then they actually did a really important study, the EPIC trial that got published on like more than 15,000 Greeks. And they looked at if they followed the diet, did it matter what their glycemic load was? The glycemic load is like high, foods with high glycemic load are bread, rice, pasta, potatoes. The, so following a Mediterranean diet improved their risk. But if they also ate low glycemic load, they lost more weight and they had better health. So really it comes back to that myth I talked about in the beginning. If you do eat a grain, a whole grain, one, think gluten-free, two, it should be a really small portion or you could skip it all together, you don't even need it. So I think you know a low glycemic load is the, really the way to go. So if, if you're following a Mediterranean diet, it's the healthiest diet on the planet, it'll be healthier 
if we don't overdo the bread, the pasta, the pizza, the rice. I mean, that just makes total sense. And I think it's better for our health and better for our waistline too. Exactly. And there's some people, they just have to find their sweet spot within that trade. I mean, there's some people that come to you probably that have to gain weight. It's probably not as frequently as the people that need to lose weight, but yeah, yes. I mean, it's just, uh, there's not one diet for all of us and not the same portion size for all of us, but I do feel that the Mediterranean diet does probably come the closest to people finding their realm within this diet that will probably work for the vast majority of people. It just yeah, seems it's, to me. I, I agree with you. It's really versatile. You can do mm -hmm. gluten-free, you could be veg vegetarian, you can do it in a low carb fashion. You um, could you be can paleo, do, you could be autoimmune. Yes, you can fall, you could deal with all those issues and still mm -hmm. follow a Mediterranean diet and personalize it to meet your needs. Absolutely, I completely agree. Okay, so you say this is not just the best diet on the planet, but also the easiest to follow. So why is it so easy to stay with? Well, it's like when I went to the market and I talked with those ladies, and when you're looking at Mediterranean food, it's about finding the right quality. So you're finding good quality local food and you don't have to do much to it. I mean, uh, there was like one time, I think I bought sole in the market and I asked the lady, okay, how would you cook it? And she goes, this is delicious. Don't ruin it by making it complicated. So you, what you want is just to saute a little olive oil at medium heat, a little salt and pepper, maybe a little thyme. That's it. Don't do anything else to it. You'll ruin it. So I think one of the beauties is it's sim the recipes are simple. And like the cooking classes, you know, a lot of these recipes we can make in a very little time. They're not complicated. So, you know, that's, I think, fantastic that if you make a diet that's easy to follow and the food's delicious, hey, that's a no-brainer. I, I want to do that. And I think right. way too many diets, you can't eat that, you can't have that. There's like 50 things you can't touch. Um, it's almost like impossible. So uh, I, I think this really is, you know, an ideal situation where it's easy to follow the recipes, the menu plans, and there's that huge variety. So you may not like Italian food, but there's Spanish, there's Greek, there's Turkish, there's North African. There's so many different flavors and spice combinations you can use and still make it a Mediterranean diet. That's so exciting. And I think that people can become, if they're not used to cooking, they can become a little intimidated by the spices and herbs. And they're so important. They're so rich in those polyphenols that feed the beneficial flora. Uh, those beneficial bacteria in our gut. And so to be able to follow the videos, to learn how to use those herbs and spices, because that really can make or break a meal. So I'm really excited for people to have the opportunity to learn from you and to follow those recipes. And I mean, just adding uh, salt and pepper to a fish can make it delicious, but adding a little bit of thyme can just, you know, make it even better. So that's exciting. Um, all right. So beyond the food and the diet, what other like aspects of the Mediterranean method really benefit health? Well, there's some non, so yes, the food is clearly good for us, right? But there's some other things as well. I mean, people in Mediterranean, they walk more than we do. They walk a lot. Mm -hmm. They like oftentimes walk or ride their bike to work and they walk to the market, if not every day, every other day. So they're out there walking. We should, we need to walk more. It's really, that's such a smart thing to do. Two, they're out with nature more often. They eat outside, they go to a park and they'll have a picnic and they walk in parks and they walk in the woods. And so they get out with nature, which is very calming to our central nervous system. And I think it helps our immune system too. And autoimmune disease, we would do better if we can get that calm from being with nature. And the way they eat is special. They're leisurely meals with people. They don't snack. Um, they have a long leisurely lunch. It, I mean, I doubt it was seldom with Marzi and Tom. I don't think we ever went out and ate, including Nicole and I, done seven months in Europe. Seldom did we spend less than 90 minutes eating because it's leisurely. You're mm -hmm. enjoying it. You talk about the food, you're laughing. It's 
joyful. So they don't eat over lunch at their computer or over their phone or at home watching TV. They eat food with people and it's social. So how we eat might be as important as what we eat as well. Mm -hmm. Getting back to those family meals, it's so important. And I feel like our society has really gotten away from that. And I feel like that's so important. Yeah, those are such important things you mentioned. In nature, right? Just getting out there, back in nature. And I know that here in the US, it's not always realistic to walk to the grocery store, but we could like, instead of fighting for those front parking places, we could park out and at least yes. walk in, right? There's Thank little you. things we could do <laughs> to make a little bit more of an effort. So, right, just a uh, little thing. Yes, park in the furthest corner of the parking lot. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay, so what are examples of recipes that come with the plan? Let me pull some out. I want to see more of those beautiful pictures in that book. Well, yeah, I mean, there's so many. I, I, I love the pictures in the book. So this is like a salad niçoise and a little and, and, and a, um, ceviche that you can make together. So, but there's so many fantastic foods. I mean, you know, when I think about like appetizers, you know, olives are a big thing in Europe. They love their olives and they're, they're not pitted. Because when you take a pitted olive and you put it in, you know, on a salt brine, it turns mushy. So they have, you have to, they come with pits on them, but they put other things. They have pickles and vegetables and other things in there. They're just awesome. And they use lots of hummus. And um, if they do have, and when they have pasta, it's an appetizer. You know, that wonderful little marinara sauce that goes on it. Um, but, you know, like they have gazpacho which is fantastic soup that goes in a blender and is, it's, you know, it has this amazing tomato and herbal spices. Um, one of my favorite soups was from Greece though. It's a Greek lemon um, chicken soup that it's amazing. It's just creamy without any dairy in it from the egg they put in it and from whipping that. But um, they have salad niçoise, which is this gorgeous salad and their mixed salad in Spain has all these colors and focal points. Eat the rainbow. Yeah. Pardon? Eat the rainbow. It's, it's the rainbow. And then with seafood, they have like paella, which is this very famous dish in Spain where you'll use fish and, and shellfish. But you, traditionally, it's cooked with a huge rice portion. What I realized is you could use cauliflower rice. Mm. It cuts the cooking time way almost to a third or in half, you do a half of what it would have been. And it still has amazing flavors. And they use saffron broth to flavor it with, which is just fantastic. I mean, that was, you know, like one of my favorite dishes with a really low glycemic load in here. I did mussels um, marinara for um, Marzi and Tom on the boat. That was great. Shrimp kebabs, you know, a roasted chicken with Mediterranean herbs. I mean, there's so many endless recipes. And, um, and they even have in dessert, Traditionally, dessert is fruit. I mean, they have watermelon or berries or cherries or something. And actually in Europe, most of the time it's free. They give you fruit after your entree. If you want to order a dessert like a cheesecake or, you know, um, chocolate mousse, you pay for that. But they just have fantastic food. So I think real everyday dessert is just plain fruit at the end of a meal and you sit with your family, friends and you enjoy it. I mean, once in a week or so, they'll make something really special that you can enjoy and um, the, the flavors are fantastic. So, I mean, the food is amazing and I wanna help everyone realize how easy it is to cook delicious, easy to prepare um, food that you can find in your grocery store. Wonderful. And really when you change your palate, it does make such a difference. And blueberries do taste like dessert. You know, this fruit does taste amazing and just yes. like dessert. So let's get into some questions. So this one is, can you provide some examples of recipes on the Mediterranean diet for dairy and gluten sensitive folks? So I'm sure your book is just riddled with- No, I mean, I think I only used two gluten recipes in the whole book. And both of those had substitutions like quinoa instead of farro or, you know, obviously pasta, you could use a pasta, a gluten-free pasta. That's easy. 
Um, dairy, they do use dairy, but you know, probably 10 to 15% of people are dairy intolerant. So, but there's several good choices out. Like there's now, um, you know, you can use it. There's this new almond ricotta. It's like ricotta cheese, but it comes from right. ground up almonds, which is like a really cool thing to do. And you can even make cheesecake with it. So, I mean, there are, you know, instead of, I think the most common dairy they use in Europe is plain yogurt. I mean, it's a good probiotic, but look, mm -hmm. you can get coconut yogurt. You don't have to, you don't have to buy dairy yogurt. There's, so the gluten-free is like easy. I mean, we it's have to so get away much from, easier these days. Yeah. I mean, we have to just think of um, less pasta, it's gluten-free and, and, and really I don't recommend, even if you're not, even if you could eat gluten and you weren't gluten sensitive, I still don't recommend bread because it's just like eating sugar to have bread. So um, but the dairy, I think there's lots of like coconut yogurts and other alternatives you can use in their place. And um, so it's really not a problem to be gluten dairy free and follow a Mediterranean eating plan. Once in a while, you know, like ricotta cheesecake. Well, there you might try that almond ricotta as a substitute and it would work pretty well. Um, if you that, I'm not sure everyone in the country could find it at their local grocery store. Might have to order it from like, you know, a food online place, but Thrive Market or something, but um, it's possible. Absolutely. Okay, so Michelle says, keeping it simple is key when you're overwhelmed as a beginner in the kitch kitchen. Love picture rich cookbooks and bonus kitchen class videos. Thank you. Um, Gracie says, what about grapeseed oil for cooking? What are your thoughts on grapeseed oil? Um, well, the good news is it does tolerate higher heat. Uh, my, my preference is if you're not using high heat, I think the healthiest oil is extra virgin olive oil. I love the flavor, but you don't, but you may not want everything to taste like it. If you're making an Asian dish, you don't want to take like olive oil. So you can use grapeseed oil. My favorite oil to cook with, if it's not extra virgin olive oil is avocado oil because it has a very high smoke point. Um, it does not go bad. It has a very subtle flavor and it has a, a high nutrient content. So that's my favorite backup oil. But I think grapes, I think she's got a good point. Grapeseed oil is a, is a good second choice for higher heat cooking when you can't use extra virgin olive oil. Okay, great. And what's your specialty, Dr. Masley? Well, I started in family medicine like uh -huh. 30 years ago, but I think for the last 15 years, I've been in functional medicine, age management medicine. I went to my first functional medicine conference almost 25 years ago, and I've been following along with Jeffrey Bland's, you know, Love group it. for 25 yeah. years. So I think I've, I, um, I think functional medicine or age management medicine would be the best way of describing what I currently do. Yeah, getting to the root cause. Yeah, personalized medicine for sure. Okay, uh, Marie says, my husband has been told to do this diet to help slow dementia. And you mentioned that it helps with cognitive decline. It, it improves. So if you follow it, you'll actually see an improvement in cognitive function and it helps prevent memory loss going on long-term. So I think it's one of the best diets on the planet for helping to prevent, for, you know, preventing memory loss. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, okay, so Barbie says, do you have breakfast recipes in the book? I do have breakfast recipes. Um, I, I think probably half the time in Europe, people don't eat breakfast. They do like a partial intermittent fast. They have tea or coffee for breakfast and that's it. But when they do eat breakfast, you know, like I think we think of Europeans as having pastry for breakfast, right? But that's like Americans on vacation having pastry mm -hmm. for breakfast. So I think typical would be like yogurt. It could either be a, you know, dairy or a coconut yogurt um, playing with fruit in it. That would be a great, you know, and you could do some, um, you know, crushed nuts or something on it too. Or if you eat eggs, you know, a frittata or an omelet um, or a shake. I like doing, I mean, typically half the time I don't eat breakfast at all. I just have tea for breakfast or coffee. And then probably a quarter of the time, I'll end up having a shake, fruit, protein in a blender, a little greens to it. And then other times I'll have eggs. So, I mean, or you could do yogurt and fruit. Those are like the most common um, breakfasts I would think of. Okay, great. 
Great. Mary says, why not a keto diet? I'm curious to know your thoughts on this. Well, you can follow a partial intermittent fasting keto diet in Mediterranean. You just skip breakfast and you're in ketosis every morning and you still get to eat the most fabulous lunch and dinners on the planet. So, I mean, that's a, you can do keto Mediterranean, but what if you had like epilepsy and you wanted to be in ketosis 24 seven? So that's a whole different challenge. That's more complicated. So for people who are trying to be 24 seven in ketosis, I mean, there's some ultra marathon runners out there who are doing it for athletic reasons, usually die, you know, people with epilepsy, some major medical issue. That's one really hard to follow. Talk about, I said the Mediterranean is the easiest to follow. Mm -hmm. The 24 seven keto diet is like the most difficult. Even people who have no choice notice that they have problems doing that. So, I mean, you're supposed to eat nine cups of like green leafies a day when you're on it. It's it's challenging and it's really hard to meet your nutrient needs. So my big concern with keto is that if you don't do it well, you're not eating like your nine cups of green leafies a day when you're on it, you're going to be really nutrient deficient and it's going to hurt mm -hmm. you. So I think most sadly, most people doing a keto diet are hurting themselves because they're not doing it right. I do exactly. think you can do it right and, and be mm -hmm. in great health, but it's not so, but it's not easy. Let me say that. So I think if you're into partial intermittent fasting with morning ketosis, boom, there's a Mediterranean diet. Mm -hmm. Why would you think of any, that would be, be a no brainer to me. That's what I would go for. I right. think that has the most health benefit. And rule out LPS before you go on a keto diet and get those lab markers tested if you're on Yes, and, and plus there's yeah, very good point, Michelle. There's some people who it's a disaster for them. So there's lab tests disaster. that you should be doing before you even think about trying it yeah. um, because it, for some people it's disastrous. Yeah, I've seen cholesterol at 664 on a keto yeah, diet. So, yeah, so. I mean, there are tests you should think about. So I'm glad you brought that up. For sure. Okay. So Mary says, is it easy to eat out? Yes. I mean, it's pretty easy. I mean, one, it's about skipping the bread plate, ordering mm -hmm. a salad, getting an appetizer and probably splitting an entree and having a fruit option for dessert. I mean, you can do that most places. That's Mediterranean food is like all, Greek, Italian, French, Spanish, Turkish, Moroccan. I mean, all of those have a Mediterranean flair to them. So mm -hmm. um, you can do it. It's about not overdoing the pasta, rice, bread portions. That's the downfall. That's how we Americanize it and ruin it. Just like, right. you know, Chinese food, you end up eating four cups of rice and a half cup of vegetables. Well, see, that's crazy. Yeah. And you have to be a little bit more selective with your restaurants, right? You Maybe can't do it at a fast food restaurant, but if you're selective with your restaurants, you absolutely can do it for sure. Yeah, that's a really good point. You, I mean, we should be able to ask for what we want. Mm -hmm. um, we can even change portion sizes and double the vegetable, a lot less of the rice. And even if it's gluten-free pasta, I want a small, half the portion. And we can ask for that and they'll do it. I mean, unless you're in a fast food place, which I would say, why are you eating there anyway? Exactly. Don't even go in there. So true. <laughs> okay. So hello from Newport Beach, California. I'm an American from Lebanon. Therefore, I grew up on a Mediterranean diet and I still cook. I love that. I love that you haven't lost that. You haven't been Americanized and um, have gone over to the fast food diet. So excellent. Nice. Yeah. Um, Mia says, how about traditionally made sourdough bread? So sourdough bread is better than non-sourdough bread um, that the, you know, they put, it's got this like probiotic like it, little, it has some acidity to it. You get a, about a 15 to 20% less of a glycemic load, but you still get 80% of the load from bread. So when you think about bread, think of the flour with it. When you have a half cup of flour, it's the same thing as eating a half cup of sugar exactly the same thing. So sourdough means it's okay, 20% less sugar, but it's still 80% of the sugar that comes in a half cup of sugar. That's a lot. That's a lot. 
So wow. yes, if you're going to eat bread, you know, I think of bread as like dessert. If I'm going out to a restaurant, so I'm lucky. I'm not gluten sensitive. Um, not, way too many people are gluten sensitive. So to me, it's like, am I having dessert or am I going to have a little piece of bread? I wouldn't have a huge dessert. So um, I, I tend to avoid it. You know, there's nothing redeeming about it. You know, I think of it bread as a dessert like food that you might have on occasion. And um, remember, there's all sorts of gluten free, you know, bread options too that you can find out there, but there's still mostly sugar. So exactly. it should be like a they're little so processed. tiny portion or skip it would be the best. It's so true. And I worry sometimes about these gluten free foods are even just more processed and they're high glycemic and, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think we're on the same page on this. <laughs> um, so then the very next question is, what about eating sprouted grain bread? For example, Dave's Killer Bread. I'm not familiar with Dave's Killer Bread. I'm not bread. familiar with it. <laughs> Probably I'm because sorry. I'm gluten-free, but um, I don't know about uh, fermenting or sprouting. It's still gluten. Mm. And if you're yeah. sensitive to gluten or if but you... But anytime you grind any grain, even if it's not a gluten grain, even if it's brown rice or you know millet and you grind it into flour, it still has that, it's, you get as much sugar rice from that as you do from eating table sugar. Exactly. So any flour, whether it's a cracker or a cereal or bread is gonna raise your sugar as much as just eating table sugar. So I usually say to my patients, well, just have a bowl of sugar and go at it with a spoon. And they look at me like, and you go, I am joking, you know, but it's the same thing. I say, if you want gluten so badly, then cook up some whole wheat berries and have at it. Nobody likes it, it's disgusting. But if we should be eating whole real nutrient dense food, yeah. then if you wanna eat gluten, eat your whole wheat berries or eat your whole rye berries. It's yucky. Well, right? but that, that is like in Europe, they'll make farro, which is, I have like one recipe for farro for people who aren't gluten sensitive so that you could, but I say, if you're gluten sensitive, don't touch it. <laughs> Even that, don't touch it. Eat, you know, you should be substituting quinoa instead. So well, quinoa is so berries. much better, I think, than cooked I mean, I don't know. I haven't had it so for so long because so if, I have yeah, celiac. I agree. If you're not gluten sensitive, then if you weren't, I would rather, much rather you eat whole, you know, grain product than, but any grain you grind up into flour is problematic. There's just no way around it. It's a processed food. Agreed. It's a processed food. Might as well just have a Twinkie. <laughs> That's so true. Okay. But I'm not recommending Twinkies just to make that clear. No, or the bowl of sugar. <laughs> We're not, we're not advocating for that. <laughs> okay, Marie says, how about rice bran oil? I don't use it very much. I don't have any, I don't have a problem with, I don't have any problem with it, you know, rice bran. I mean, it's probably a healthy source of fiber. Um, I just don't use it very much. I'd have to have some recipes where I thought, I've never had a recipe that I thought was delicious with it. So maybe it's good, but I'm, I'm not familiar with it, sorry. Yeah, me either. Okay, Gracie says, is grapeseed oil better to saute vegetables than coconut oil? Well, coconut oil has a lower smoke point than extra virgin olive oil. So really? coconut oil smoke points only 350, extra virgin olive oil is 400. So really coconut oil isn't really something you cook with. If it's the virgin stuff, if it's refined and processed and they treat it with chemicals and they heated it and damaged it, now you can use it, but I don't recommend that. So the, the natural virgin ex, you know, coconut oil is really delicate and burns at high smoke. You know, we used to put it what, like popcorn because it didn't taste bad when you put it at high heat, but it was bad for you. So, so yes, if you're gonna cook with high heat, I would rather you use, um, other oils, avocado oil, grapeseed oil, not extra virgin olive oil, and even worse would be coconut oil. A coconut oil is like I put in a curry, but what I do is I'll probably use avocado or almond oil at first, or maybe macadamia nut oil, and I'll cook with it, 
And at the end, I'll add coconut milk or coconut oil when it's at simmer, really low temperature, so I can get the, the nutrient benefit of the coconut oil and the flavor of the coconut oil, but I don't want to damage it. So that's what I, I do with that. coconut oil. And sometimes you do that with extra virgin olive oil too. I'll add it at the end. After I sear something at higher heat, I add the end for flavor and nutrient value. I'll do that too with steamed veggies and then I'll drizzle it over the top. Yes, that would, you could drizzle it at the end when it's on simmer or when you put it in a bowl or something like that. Okay, great. Sophia says, if a person is underweight and skips breakfast, um, it will be hard to keep it a good weight. What is the solution to gain weight healthfully? Well, I look at um, more cows. So here's where you might want to eat a whole grain. If you're trying to gain weight and let me make an assumption, your blood sugar is normal, then I would let someone have whole grain breads and whole grain crackers. And I would say in that case, they should be more avocado and they should eat more nuts and they could pour more extra virgin olive oil on their food. Um, so I'd be giving them more high calorie sources as long as their blood sugar levels were totally normal. And that's, and, and that's, and I'd have them do strength training to build muscle mass. So wait, you know, it's like less aerobic, more strength training to build muscle. Those are yeah. usually the solutions I use when someone, when someone comes to me with low weight, you see their blood sugar, not always, but mo most of the time it's okay. So yeah, we're looking at, I give them more whole glycemic load. Potatoes have more glycemic load as an example. Um, so potatoes and brown rice and lots of nuts. And th th that's, that's generally my strategy. And strength training, don't forget strength training. Personalized nutrition. There's yes. not one right diet for everyone. I like that. Yes, so fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, insulin, just make sure that all of those are in healthy ranges, right? Okay, Absolutely. good. All right. So Brian says, what would you suggest for breakfast for those who put on who put out lots of energy in the morning versus those who have low um, energy output? The same for those who need to have high mental energy versus low mental output in the morning. Well, the worst thing for your mental energy is like to have a quick carb diet, like breakfast cereal, like a donut, like a pastry. They've actually shown in studies that when they feed people high glycemic load food, something sugary or loaded with flour, their sugar goes up and then it plummets and they have decreased cognitive performance all day. They get less work done. So if you're really interested in your cognitive performance, you want to eat on low glycemic level. You want to you know, so that's why I was saying plain yogurt, whether it's dairy or coconut yogurt with fruit and nuts, or you're having an egg with a frittata, or you're having a shake with protein and some fruit in it. So you're doing something that doesn't have a high glycemic load that's going to give you low energy all day. And I, I would really, I, I mean, a shake is my favorite breakfast for people who are need energy because it's gonna sustain them all morning. They're not gonna be hungry. You can make it in two minutes. It's easy. <laughs> Gluten-free, dairy-free, no problem. I mean, a shake just... for breakfast is gonna, you know, it's gotta have protein, like 20 grams of protein in it. And I usually want berries and I want greens. And you could even put in some healthy fat with it. And that's gonna sustain you all day. Exactly. And just make sure that you are checking how many sugar grams, because I've seen people make those into a little dessert shake. <laughs> well, yeah, that's why I said berries, greens. Exactly. Protein, so what you and, said. And the liquid would be like unsweetened almond milk. That way Love you're it. not loading them with this. Thank you for bringing that sugar up. You're absolutely right. I totally yeah. agree with you, Michelle. That's great. Um, okay, and I just was thinking about all the kids going to school on this bowl of cereal and their blood sugar is just doing this and then they're crashing and their brain, they can't even think. So if you have kids in school, feed them a nutrient dense breakfast that's yes. not full of carbs. And I know that that's like the typical breakfast here in the US and I but don't know. Shakes are a great breakfast for kids. For kids. Shakes or a, an omelet with veggies to it. 
Um, again, yogurt, fruit and nuts, all those are good choices mm -hmm. for kids. Something that's just gonna say sustain. The worst thing, I mean, pancakes and syrup, are you kidding? Just, you know, it's finish tragic. your child off and have them, you know, by 10 a.m. their brains are, you know, they, they've lost their energy. Exactly. Oh, okay. So um, Leah says, what about gluten-free oats? Well, oats, if, okay, this is a, con you know, so it depends where are they produced. So here's something I learned recently at a medical conference, the American College of Nutrition is, this surprised me. You know, I wasn't so picky about always buying organic oats, but I didn't realize most of the oats that are out there are treated with Roundup at the end to get them to desiccate, dry the plants and make the harvest easier. I do not want to eat oats that were treated with Roundup to make the harvest easier. So they have to be organic. Number that, I, I mean, that just shocked me to hear these reports, but um, so number one, organic oats or skip them because of the Roundup use is just so high nowadays. Two, are they from an, a gluten-free facility? If they are, they're gluten-free. You know, oats don't normally have gluten in them. The problem is oftentimes they're from a facility where they run on the conveyor belt wheat products and then they run oats and they get all mixed up. And so, yeah. um, so those to me are the, it should be organic and they should be from a gluten-free facility like Red Mill, there's many brands out there. I mean, Michelle, do you have anything else to add to that? Those are my two big points for oats. I agree with you completely. They've tested uh, oats and if they are not bragging about it on the label, all of it is contaminated with gluten. So they need to be labeled gluten-free, but that I've just learned something new. I didn't realize they were- yeah. And gluten-free facility. And gluten-free, right. I didn't realize they were spraying it with glyphosate. We have to- Yeah, the glyphosate to me is like a huge complicating factor. It didn't occur to, occur to me that common, just typical um, <laughs> oats would be sprayed to make the harvest easier. Yeah, it sickens me that we're allowing this to take place. Uh, so the last question is, um, do you address how to gain weight in the book? And it's a recipe book, so I'm guessing not. Um, but just eating nutrient dense food, right? And working with a practitioner to help find out why she can't gain weight. Wouldn't you recommend that? Or what would you recommend for her well, specifically? I do, this is more than a recipe book. So it's about, oh. there's 50 recipes, but the book, um, Mediterranean Method, is about 80% health content. And there's information oh. on exercise and supplements and um, stress management and mindful eating and plus the whole Mediterranean diet. So there's tons of information in this. Um, but I do, you know, for gaining weight, again, it comes back to strength training is so important. I think, you know, I, I, people have overdone the aerobic component, you know, doing endless periods, you know, they can do some interval training, burst training three, four days a week, but adding strength training to different body parts to help build muscle mass is so important. And then adding calorie dense food, as long as your blood sugar is good, you know, you can even eat higher glycemic load food as long as your blood sugar and insulin levels are fine. Um, but, you know, more avocado, more nuts, more extra virgin olive, you know, more of those higher calorie foods need to be a much bigger part of the diet for weight gain. Although, honestly, 90% of my patients, that's not the issue that they have. Yeah, they need to work with a functional medicine practitioner and find out what's at the root cause of the inability to yes. gain weight because there's always a reason. There's always a reason. Well, this has been such a pleasure. I love that it's a whole method. I love that you address stress because I feel like that's such a key component in all of these imbalances and states of unwell. So that's beautiful. And I can't wait to get my hands on a copy myself. So thank you so much for joining us. And I hope everybody has a wonderful evening or morning wherever you are in the world. Thank you, Dr. Masley. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Dr. Tom. Yes. And Marzi, get well. <laughs>